Hello, everyone. I am Ping Liang. As you know, I'm a longtime member of the World Affairs Council and a former board president. Uh, welcome back to Great Decisions, our award-winning and most prestigious series. Today is our fifth program in this series, Afghanistan to Fight or Run. Tonight's program is sponsored by the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. We're able to bring the Great Decision Series to you because we enjoy great support from our community partners like the Ford Foundation. So we want to thank them very much. It's such an honor and a privilege for us to host Ambassador Ronald E. Newman, President of the American Academy of Diplomacy. That is a Washington, uh, Washington DC-based um, think tank. Ambassador Newman has had a long and distinguished career as an American diplomat since he first joined the US State Department in 1970. With tremendous knowledge about the Middle East region and Near East affairs. In fact, he started getting to know Afghanistan when his father, Robert G. Newman, was the US ambassador to Afghanistan from 1966 to 1973. Like his father, who served as a US ambassador three times to Afghanistan, Morocco, and then Saudi Arabia. Ambassador Newman served three times as a US ambassador as well to Algeria, Bahrain, and finally to Afghanistan from July 2005 to April 2007. Before Afghanistan, Ambassador Newman served in Baghdad from February 2004 with the Coalition Provisional Authority and then as the US Embassy's political and military liaison with the multinational command. Ambassador Newman has won several awards, both during his services in the US State Department, as well as for his military services in the US Army. He has traveled extensively and frequently in the Near East and Middle East regions. His most recent trip to Afghanistan was in October 2016. Ambassador Newman is the author of The Other War, Winning and Losing in Afghanistan, a book on his time in that country, exploring political and military issues there. We also warmly welcome Ambassador Newman's wife, Elaine, to Grand Rapids. Moderating tonight's discussion is Dr. Polly Devon, Director of International Relations Program at Grand Valley State University. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Newman and Dr. Devon. Well, thank you for that very kind, very warm introduction. Ed. Great to see that so many people came out on a snowy day. Not sure what that says about your judgment, but I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you for being, thank you for being here. Afghanistan is a very complicated place. You probably already guessed that. Uh, one of the penalties of being complicated is that if you have your mind really made up, you can go to Afghanistan and then you can treat it a little bit like going to the supermarket when you've decided what your dish is for dinner. You can find the ingredients that fit the theory you brought with you so that you can go to Afghanistan and you can find the pieces that make it clear that it's absolutely not working and it's going to fail. And you can come back and you can write the message that says, I've been there and it won't work. And if you're really a determined supporter, you can go. And then you can come back and write the absolute opposite piece and say, I was there and this is the way it is. Now, in all fairness, I am not a totally disinterested observer. I have, you might say, skin in the game. 
I was ambassador in Afghanistan. I was involved in the policy. I keep going back, and I have a lot of Afghan friends and a lot of younger Afghan people uh, that they're sometimes the only ones who really inspire me, and I would like it not to fail. But at the end of the day, I will try to be as objective as I can, and we have to focus on the fact that we have, as Americans, our own interests. Now, this is actually a pretty good time to talk about Afghanistan, despite the fact that it is not much in the news. You know, when I wrote my book, 2009, I called it The Other War, because Iraq had so dominated the news that we were, at that point, losing the war in Afghanistan, quite frankly, because we were sucking all the resources out, putting them in Iraq. And then Afghanistan became the war with President Obama. We put a lot into it. And now it's become, again, kind of the other war. So that some of you may realize that we have still more troops in Afghanistan than we have in Iraq and Syria put together. But you don't really think about it because it's not the flavor, the flavor of the month. That's OK up to a point, except we're starting to draw down resources so that General Nicholson just barely has enough combat aircraft. And he does, we're drawing down some of the surveillance stuff that is so important. So we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's a bit of a problem. Why do I say it's a good time? Well, the National Security Council is about to begin a review for the Trump administration of Afghanistan. I don't know how long they're going to take to do that, but they're starting. Um, they may do more of it when they have a few more officials, but they're starting. The uh, General Nicholson has asked for more troops. The commander in Afghanistan has asked for more troops. General Votel, the commander of Central Command, has supported that request. So since American policymakers are beginning to talk about Afghanistan, it's probably a good time American citizens should be thinking about it. I recognize that, that we often don't think about the wars that don't affect us. I, I don't think that's something new. I think that is always been there. I was struck way, way back, 1969, in Vietnam, I remember a kid in my platoon telling me that until he had been drafted, his family had never had a, a view about Vietnam, one way or the way. We'd been at war for years. Till he was drafted, was not on the table. So it's not on the table now in Afghanistan. That isn't too surprising. But we do have 10,000 troops there. And we need to address this question. What are we doing? Is it worth it? To talk about that, I want to really talk about Four questions. Is it worthwhile? Where are we? Can we succeed? And also, what does success mean? And at what cost? I will argue, I do argue, that it is worthwhile to sustain the effort in Afghanistan for some very specific reasons. One is that whether we like it or not, we are in a very long-term struggle with radical Islam, Islamic terrorism, whatever you like to call it. There is a, it's not all of the Islamic world by any means, but there are radical forces with whom we are in a struggle from which it is very difficult to unilaterally withdraw when the other side thinks they're still at war. Afghanistan is where that war began. It's where Osama bin Laden wrote that he would draw the Americans in. They would not be able to sustain it. And that then when they lost, this would be a great proof uh, that God was on their side. I think that's something we'd rather avoid. Uh, it is also a place from which instability can radiate much more broadly uh, in Central Asia, into Pakistan. What we do there has a stabilizing or destabilizing effect on a huge area around us. Uh, it is also a place from which we need to be able to operate. And it is a country into which the Islamic State is now beginning to return, trying to get in. Sorry, not return. They weren't there before. And Al-Qaeda is still there. And I don't think we can afford to turn our back on that uh, if we have a choice. Now, those are reasons for staying, but that raises the question of where are we? We've been at this a long time. And as I said, Afghanistan is complicated. I uh, 
often think of a friend of mine, a former interior minister, and he, would, he was asked, can you explain Afghanistan in one or two words? And he said, yes, one word, good. Two words, not good. <laughs> uh, that's kind of where we are, frankly. Good, not good, mixed. Let me try to give you a very short uh, sort of bottom line for both of those. On the good side, we don't really talk about that in the news much because good news doesn't sell papers, I suppose. Uh, so on the good news, we have made commendable strides in education. There were about a million students, almost all boys, and legally all boys, in school when we came. There were about eight million. Statistics, frankly, aren't very good, but they're a rough order of magnitude. There are about eight million in school now, of which about a third are women. Uh, health has picked up a great deal. Death, a, mortality rates are up, uh, are better now. Mother-child health care is better. Mortality of infants is down. It, it's still high on a world count, but it's definitely down. Uh, there is a big youth population, and many of whom are now educated, some of whom are in this audience, that simply didn't exist in Afghanistan 16 years ago, and they really are the hope of the country and they're impressive. Whether Afghanistan can survive for them to take power eventually, I think is a question, but they are impressive. I'm on the uh, advisory board of a small girls boarding school in Kabul. It's Afghan run, it's all Afghans. When I was there in October, I went out and had breakfast with them, and I was having, sitting at a table with well, 10 girls from second, third grade up to about sixth grade now. Yeah, the littlest was about yay high. And uh, tremendous energy. And I, but I asked them, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, it's been a long time since my kids were that small, but I'm not sure how many answers you'd get out of American students right off the bat if you asked second, third, fourth graders what do you want to be. They went around that table, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a judge, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to be a teacher. Um, I don't know whether they will each follow what they think they might follow now, but it was, it was an impressive, and, and they were all, by the way, speaking fluent English, even those who were like six and seven years old had never been out of Afghanistan. It, it's just a, a tiny vignette of the kind of thing that can encourage you in the young population. Uh, tax collection is getting better, finance collection is getting better. Democracy, Afghanistan has started. It's a very convoluted path. The elections have, on the one hand, been very corrupted, and on the other hand, in the last election, despite all sorts of death threats, about seven million people voted, which was a very large percentage of the electorate, despite threats. And very importantly, Power changed hands as a result of the election. Changed hands peacefully. Took a big political crisis, came near meltdown, but it did change hands. You have to go a long way from Kabul to find, with the exception of India, to find other countries in the region where power has changed hands peacefully. Those are all the positives. Those are things to remember on the, the sort of opposed to nothing has been done. And there are positive pieces in the military, too. And there are some negatives I'll come to in a minute. But you have units within the military, the commandos, that are fighting very well. Air Force is beginning to perform. There are a lot of downsides, but we've really only been at the Army in a big way for about six years. We tend to say we've been in Afghanistan 16, which is true. We only made the decision in the Obama administration in 2009 to begin building the army of the size it is now, which means the funding and a lot of that really began in 2010. It's a much shorter time period than many people think, and while that army has a lot of problems, it has not been throwing down its guns and running away. It has not melted down the way the Iraqi army, into which we put a lot more money earlier, uh, did in Mosul. Those are some of the good sides. Now, bad side. Um, way too much corruption. 
drug problems, poor governance. Military situation is not good. It's not a disaster, but it is what I would call a very slowly eroding stalemate. Government will not lose the big cities. It's not about to fall, but it is gradually, little by little, losing control over population, and that is definitely a negative. The corruption, the selling offices, things like this, that's very destructive to the, the government. So there, there's, lots, there's lots of bad news. It's just better known, so I'm not spending as much time on the detail, but I, I think we need to recognize it's there. Given this balance, given, you know, okay, there's some great stuff and there's some reasons to be there, but there's a lot of problems in the military and there's a lot of problems with corruption. Can we succeed? What does that mean? Well, I would say yes, but I think we have to redefine a little bit what does victory mean. Now, this is close to, but it is not intended to be a sophistry. You know, it's easy if you think you can't win one way, let's redefine it and then let's call that victory. <laughs> That's not what I'm about. We have a problem, though. The kind of victory we had in World War II, the state surrenders and we go home, is not available in the kind of wars and military confrontations we are in. If that's the kind of victory you want and you can't have it, then you have two choices. Every place that we are attacked, every threat from non-state actors, we have to assume that we lose or we don't engage. Or all engagement is perpetual and hopeless. There's no point in having political ends. That's a paradigm that I don't think we can live with and I don't think it's a correct answer. So the question is then, can you, can you have a definition of winning that is not just a sophistry to cover the fact that you can't w really win or not? I think you can. I think in Afghanistan, it is basically a situation in which you no longer will have a danger of large-scale exportation of instability or attacks on us and the homeland and our friends. That's a limited, that doesn't mean there's no violence. That means it's pushed into the periphery. It means you have an Afghan state and army able to contend probably for a very long time with a continuing level of violence. But I think that is for us strategically what winning means. Now, can you do that? I, I should say also, Yes, you, uh, you want to keep the door open to a negotiated peace. But the long term, really ending the war means some kind of political negotiation. But I would say two quick things about that. One, you only get that kind of political negotiation when all the parties find that they've got a stalemate, that they just, they can't win. They're not, nobody's gonna win, but they can get enough of what they want in some form of political arrangement. We're simply not there yet large part of why we're not there is because we keep U.S. policy in doubt. Uh, someday, maybe we will. We ought to stay open to that. We should support the Afghan government. It should be part of a policy, but it can't be the driver because we're not there yet. That means success, even as I've defined it, is long term. Now, what does such a policy require? Well, first, I would say it would be really good if we would stop making some of the repeated errors that we keep doing over and over again. One of those is our deadlines in time, which always causes doubt about what our intentions are, what the real policy is, and encourages the Taliban to wait us out. We have never set a deadline in Afghanistan that made any sense, and the way we have kept those deadlines has never made any sense, because they've constantly driven us to move too fast. So we didn't finish the advisory effort before we pulled advisors off. We pulled the air, air off. For two years, we had restrictive rules of engagement after we stopped our major combat operations in 2014. We took the position that we're not at war with the Taliban, except if they happen to be attacking us. Then we can use air power to defend ourselves. And if they're about to overrun an Afghan unit, we could maybe use it then. Otherwise, 
Taliban are free to group, to move around, to maneuver. We can fly over, we can look at them, but we're not allowed to bomb them. You know, you know, so that they can kill us any day of the week, we can kill them on alternate Mondays if it fits our rules of engagement. I mean, this just didn't, that's a major reason for the success, a lot of the success they had in the last two years. Was they, we trained the Afghan army to fight with air power, and then we took the air power away before they had an air force. We could stop doing some of those things. Uh, we need basically to make a trade. On our side, we need to stabilize the battlefield. And on the Afghan government's side, there needs to be a movement toward a good deal of cleaning up, particularly in the military and in certain areas in corruption. To make that trade work, we need to get a little better at conditionality. We talk about conditionality, we've done this, we and the international community, some 60 odd donors, do a terrible job at this. We talk about conditionality, then we define things in ways that we really can't afford politically to do, then we don't do them, then we undercut our conditionality, then we put it back on the table again, but now it has less credibility than it had before, so why would you pay any attention? There are ways to do conditionality that are more effective, and we need to do those. We need probably a few more troops. We don't need a surge. We don't need thousands more troops. We do need to fill a few holes. We don't cover every core, which means that we don't know what's going on. It's very hard to have sound policy if you have no idea what is happening. Um, we do not need to have advisors walking around the field with every Afghan company or battalion or brigade. And we're not, this is one of these areas where we're not clear at all with the American people. What are we talking about? We say we need a few more people. Well, you know, the image that comes to mind is advisors on the ground, Vietnam, the helicopters coming in. I've done that, thank you. Um, something like that. And that's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about the fact that we still need to develop some very sophisticated systems. We talk about logistics. That's one where we only began to work on developing Afghan logistics in about 2011. What does logistics beat? Let me just pull this one example. Could be a lot of other things. At the most rudimentary, logistics means that when your unit needs to go out to fight, the, it has fuel, the trucks run, they have spare parts, they have ammunition. You can fight. Your bat, it'd be good if your radios have batteries too. Um, what does that require? That requires in a landlocked country thousands of miles away from a supply line that you are projecting months in advance what you're going to need, that you know how to order it in bulk, that you have a way of getting it broken down, distributed, sent down to units. So there's a long and very complex process that means that when a fighting man needs to roll out the door, he has what he needs to roll. That's part of, the pro that's part of what we need advisors to do. And because we don't cover every core, let alone below the core, we don't know if the logistics system is broken. So we need to increase that kind of advisory effort so that we can fix and work on these things that are the, the higher supply functions, what the military would call the enablers, that we have not adequately done because we were too busy leaving, but which do not take thousands more people. But right now, a lot of Afghanistan for us is black hole. We don't know how well some people are fighting. because We're not there. So <clears throat> we need to press Pakistan because it's really hard to win an insurgency if you have sanctuaries. And you have. That's a long subject. I do not think there is a silver bullet. I don't think that we will get Pakistan easily to change, but I think we have to hold out both improved conditions if they do and increasing pressure over time if they don't. Above all, we need, if we're going to follow the kind of policy I'm recommending, we need to be very clear that we're in this for the long term. 
And as long as you're not clear, everybody else moves around. And this is a problem for the United States overall. I could do a whole separate talk, sometimes I do, um, on our importance to alliances because we are so important in the world that friends, enemies, and people who really don't want to be involved all make policies with some reference to what the Americans are going to do. And when they don't know what the Americans are going to do, they guess, or they make assumptions. And in many cases, they make kind of worst case assumptions. And that can lead your allies to do things that you don't want them to do. It can lead to proliferation. It can lead to all kinds of problems, including accidental wars. In Afghanistan, it leads people to steal more because we may leave them in the lurch and they may have to run. It leads Pakistan to be encouraged to maintain its ties to the Taliban. It leads, encourages the Taliban to keep fighting. So if we are going to stay and follow this kind of policy, we need to be clear that we're going to do it for a while. And we, that needs to have credibility. We need to keep the door to peace open, but not chase after it because it makes us look desperate, makes the price go higher. We need to support the Afghan government. I would say we need to maintain but not expand aid levels. We don't need to be doing massively more aid than we're doing, but we need to be consistent again so you can plan. So, long talk, probably have raised your confusion to a higher level of detail. <laughs> um, I think, to summarize, we have too much to lose to just quit. We have to refocus. We have to redefine our objectives clearly. I've suggested one definition. We have to stay open to an Afghan-led peace, but in the meantime, we have to stabilize the battlefield. We have to demand better performance from the Afghans without being unrealistic about what is possible. And someplace down the road, we would have to be prepared to quit if, in fact, they don't perform. But that's quite a ways down the road against more reasonable sorts of expectations. So having probably opened as many questions as I've concluded, <laughs> let me stop there and go to questions. And thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much. Well, that was really fascinating. I'm glad to hear some of your, your questions, because you you have left me with a lot of questions. Good. I noticed you taking notes. Oh, so I, I take I notes all the time. I figured you weren't going to be short of questions. <laughs> um, I want to start by asking you, since you mentioned Vietnam, and since you fought in Vietnam, presumably, no. and you've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, I wonder if you'd be willing to compare and contrast, because to people like me who've never been to either, a certain parallel of never knowing when to quit, saying mm -hmm. we're there for the mm -hmm. long run, always thinking a few more people, a few more money, you know, a little more money, a few more people. It seems like there's no end in sight. Can you, can you reflect a little bit on what's different? Yeah. I, or same? I don't no, know. No, I, I have. And I even went to a conference once where they tried to do that. The trouble was there's almost nobody who's done both, which makes good comparisons hard. I mean, okay, I did Vietnam, but, you know, as an infantry officer, that's mm -hmm. pretty narrow view. Uh, start with the military situation. Afghanistan is a very much an irregular war of insurgency. Vietnam was much more a conventional war fought with unconventional tactics in which you were dealing with a regular army, a regular government sponsoring it. Very, very different. By, by the time I was in Vietnam, 1969-70, I was way up in the north of what was then South Vietnam, along the DMZ. We had almost no Viet Cong up there. We had regular North Vietnamese army units coming across in neat little clean uniforms and pith helmets, um, driven down to the border in trucks, and then marching across um, with a lot of support. So a very, very different war to start with. Boats were confusing. I think in one of the similarities, I think, is that we too often try to make policy without any reference to the local folk. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we, you know, Ameri I don't know, this is a weird problem of Americans that we tend to want to make foreign policy without reference to foreigners. The, the <laughs> trouble. Um, but it's a debility because in the end, the foreigners seem to have to be involved. Yeah. Um, it's a very long-running problem. 
Uh, there was a, a book by a former CIA director, uh, Colby, who spent years being involved in Vietnam. At one point, he writes about a policy derived in Washington, which was obvious to him was never going to be acceptable to DM, and it wasn't. But right. that didn't stop us from having the policy. Um, a little while ago, I did a chapter on American cultural assumptions uh, in, that we take to war about Afghanistan, a book that I hope will get published in the next month or so. And uh, I documented a lot of very similar phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, policies where we have no reference to how they're perceived by the foreigners. They're completely misunderstood. They lead to all sorts of wrong conclusions as a result. So that's similar. Um, there is a danger of moving goalposts. I think we have, the goalposts we have moved though have been extraordinarily different. In Vietnam, we wanted much more the conventional kind of victory. And, and we went into these massive conventional, I mean, we fought the war completely differently and in some ways probably wrongly. Um, in Afghanistan, we've had moving goalposts, but I think they've been different. First of all, they drifted. We, we've really gone through a whole series of steps. First, we were only going to hunt terrorists, and we probably blew the best opportunity we had for the first mm -hmm. two or th two half years in Afghanistan by not doing anything to stabilize the country. We didn't even get to economic assistance until 2004. All the money we spent from 2001 to 4 was humanitarian assistance, just band-aids for uh, humanitarian problems. And then we sort of let things expand in the Bush era until it looked like we were trying to replicate our own democracy. And then the Obama administration came along, understood that it needed to condense the goals to have more limited goals. But it adopted this goal of degrade and destroy the Taliban and prevent it from coming back. As a, that's it. That's the limited goal. We're not, and they were explicit. We're not going to do nation building. Ah, wait a minute. You're going to keep it from coming back. For that, you need an army. For an army, you need a state. For a state, dang, you need an economy. Um, and then you're into nation building. Mm -hmm. And so we have moved the goalpost, but partly it's been in policy incoherence. And I think one of the, my takeaway is that the, a fundamental problem we've had in several cases, and Vietnam is one of them, and Afghanistan is another, but they're not the same, is a lack of appropriate political goals at the national command level, which means the president, which could be defined to the American people and around which the military, from which the military and the political strategy can be derived. Mm -hmm. And we're not, so I in, think we in the end point of Vietnam, I Sorry, think many people, no, I'm answer. just trying to get yeah. a handle on one thing. At the end of Vietnam, I think many people would say, well, we should have left five or seven or eight years earlier because we weren't doing anything at the end. Are we going to say that about Afghanistan, that really we've been wasting our time and money? We, we could. Um, I'm not even sure we were, you know. I mean, one issue is with the end of Vietnam. Arvin was not the Army of the Republic of Northern Vietnam. Arvin was not fighting badly in the last couple of years. They took on a major attack in 1972. We still supported them with air power, but no ground forces. And they were attacked by large numbers, including tanks, and they turned them back. By the fall in 75, we had cut off funding for supplies, for ammunition. Um, there, there, was a, there were a lot of other problems in Vietnam, but one of the problems was this feeling that they had been abandoned, that there was no more help coming. Um, and that was part of the defeat. So we have a very simplified narrative now that they never fought. Um, I mean, I, we gave out a million weapons to local and rural forces. Some of them fought well, some of them were incompetent, and almost none of them turned those weapons against the central government. And that, that's an unknown, you know, anyway, I didn't come here to talk Vietnam, sorry. But, um, so, I think yeah, you're arguing we should still be in Vietnam, is no, that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I think we could, have, we could have maintained a passive support in finance and weapons and might have a different outcome, but who knows, that's, you know, long gone. We could get to that point in Afghanistan. Um, 
I think one thing we need is we do need clear conditionality, but it needs we need to be able to say what is it we want to see changed. And then we have to do it in ways that aren't completely unrealistic so we don't find that we're just making up, well, this good stuff shows that we still should have another year. Now, we're really good at that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think we need to be, I think we need to be clearer with ourselves to begin with on what our conditions are. Mm -hmm. But we tend to go to extremes. We want to see massive improvement in changing the whole structure of government, or we want to call every little improvement some proof that something's happening without real analysis. I, I think with that, we need to get away from it. Is that based on pressure from home? Is that based on domestic political consequences in the US? Some of it is based on domestic, well, you've got, you've got domestic political pressure that comes and goes. And right now, frankly, it's gone. I mean, there's very little pressure to get out of it. There was a lot of political pressure um, up until, I would say, 2012 or 13 to reduce. And then when the Islamic State began and everything fell apart in Iraq and everybody had taken their eyes off Iraq, then all of a sudden there was a sort of, <clears throat> oh my God, <laughs> you know, we don't want that to happen in Afghanistan. So talking to, talking to members of Congress, I found in the last few years that there's no intense pressure to get out. And the fact that Americans are by and large ignoring the war also means there's no real pressure. So the, the pressure on the Obama administration in the last two or three years has been internal to the administration, their view of what they wanted in the world. But it's not been generated from the outside. That may reverse if things go, go very badly, but it's not there right now. The other pressure is, of course, our bureaucratic pressure to show that things are working. And so you you know, you, you have in the military and in the civilians this desire to spin things to show progress. Mm -hmm. And what you, if you really spin things enough, what you do is you lose credibility. Mm -hmm. With everybody, you don't actually. Spin make. within reason. Yeah, spin within reason. Well, <laughs> if you explain what you're going to look for in advance, then you can talk about how much of it you're seeing. Now, you're always going to have a problem that whatever you say honestly about things that don't go well will be used to beat you up by people who really just want to change the policy. Mm -hmm. But I think for credibility, you have to accept some of that. Mm -hmm. So do you think it would have been um, a better strategy or a more feasible strategy to just, in 2001, when we had been attacked by Al-Qaeda, to go in and wipe out Al-Qaeda but leave the Taliban in place? Could we have just done that and kept it simple? <laughs> Not disrupted the government? Because, you know, people say, now, without the Taliban in place, we have a lot more heroin, you know, a lot more drug problem, a lot more corruption, you know, sort of this internal mm -hmm. fighting that wouldn't have been there if we had just wiped out Al Qaeda but left the Taliban. Now, of course, there's a human rights issue and women's well, issue and all yeah. these things. But what, what do you think well, about that? Well, first problem was I don't think that was possible because Al Qaeda was embedded in the Taliban. If if Taliban had been willing to give up, Al Qaeda wouldn't have gone in, in the first place. That was our condition. Secondly, as soon as we went in, it was the Taliban forces with Al Qaeda reinforcements that attacked. Uh, so all of the heavy fighting, you know, people, special forces running around on horses and dropping bombs, and that was all, that was all Taliban. I mean, predominantly Taliban fighters that they're killing, mm -hmm. mixed in okay. with Al Qaeda. So you didn't have any way of surgically taking out Al Qaeda. We could have come in. What, knocked the Taliban government out and then just said, you know, have a good civil war, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see where that would have met our objectives because I think the Taliban would have regrouped, uh, regrouped with Al Qaeda mm -hmm. uh, and they were still more organized than anybody else because everybody else was losing when we came in. So I don't think you could have done it. People criticize probably with some justification for the fact that the Taliban were not involved in the peace negotiations. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, everybody else who was involved would have found it completely unacceptable. So we would have had to have a much heavier political presence and dominate the country in order to force them to accept the Taliban in the negotiations. I think that's wonderful political, you know, 2020 hindsight and completely unrealistic right. in practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about removing any military involvement in Afghanistan and just having our total 
involvement there be based on you know soft power and education and the youth development and things you were talking about, but removing any kind of military involvement? Is that possible or feasible? I think, I think it, that would appeal to some people. I think it would eventually be, if not totally possible, you could do a lot of it. But you can't, I don't think you could do it yet. Um, you know, we pulled out the air cover without bringing the Afghan Air Force into the fight. Now there's Air Force is starting to perform, it's starting to make tactical strikes. It still needs a lot of training and it needs a lot more equipment. Um, so I think you would be rushing your fences. And then we have some particular problems. You know, we, we built part of the Afghan helicopter support around Russian helicopters which was perfectly sensible. They're easier to operate than ours that are very sophisticated. They're, Afghans have experience in maintaining them. They're actually better at high altitude than our helicopters. Only then we impose sanctions because of Ukraine. So now <laughs> you can't buy spare parts with our money for the Russian helicopters we bought the Afghans. You know, that kind of stuff kind of sets you back a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we, we need to, we need to fix that. We need to change the law and buy more helicopters, or we need to give them American. So, I, I think you you should be able to see a declining kind of pace for American advisors. And as it is, you don't have you have very few that are in combat now. It's much more logistics and bureaucrat bureaucratic stuff. Um, and I think it could go down further. But I think we're paying a price for the fact that we tried to rush out too fast two years ago. And so now, you know, it's sort of like if you fail the course and you go right on the graduate course, this probably doesn't work well. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're probably going to have to learn the <laughs> lesson you had in the first time. But how long are you going to be in grad school? This is the question. I mean, yeah, you know, no, you it's, say a, it's a fair <laughs> it's a fair question, and I don't know how to answer it I because I don't know any... I don't know anybody who knows enough to even say what is a totally realistic timeline. I think you can say, here's some things I need to see in the next year. I need to see, frankly, new ministers of interior and defense because they're very weak. I need to see that they have given the authority to start cleaning up those ministries. I don't expect the ministries are going to be totally clean. I need to see that a couple of key core commanders have been replaced by people who can really fight and inspire their people. Now, if you don't see any of that, you're screwed, frankly. Yeah. Um, you know, not to make it too sophisticated. Um, but that doesn't mean you're winning the war in a year. But I, I can't tell you that I could put five years of standards like that out. But I'd like to put some of those out, some of which would be public and some of those which probably would not be public then I think you could know whether you're making progress on them. Mm -hmm. I think now our standards of progress are too vague. Mm -hmm. Do you take, I mean, I, I've been reading, I'm trying to feel... I, I hope I'm not totally dodging the question, but... No, I, some I, of my, I think I, you're not at all, but I'm just curious yeah. about it because I, I, I don't think we should tell the, the, the powers that be in Afghanistan what our timeline is, but I think we do need to have some kind of endpoint. I mean, it's not free. Yeah. You know, I mean, no. this is a lot. But this of money. is why I think what's part of what's a problem right now is our long-term timeline has never been credible, and our short-term timeline has been exaggerated. Mm -hmm. So that we get all the negatives from people believing we're going to leave faster than we are, mm -hmm. without getting really the positive pressure we want. Is there a is there a growing or consistent level of anti-Americanism that? We only increase by staying. Do you see what I mean? I, I see. I don't. The broad overall question, the answer is no. You get, you get, if you break it down and you start going down to province level, you will find you get more anti-Americanism and more anti-government support when you have really heavy fighting and people are caught between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, and the Asia Society has done uh, annual polls for mm -hmm. a number of years now. They're mm -hmm. very good. By most of those measures, there is no huge growing movement of anti-Americanism. In fact, one of the problems that there is some evidence that the Taliban is having a problem because with the removal of our combat forces, they're having a problem saying, why are you still fighting? 
you're calling it jihad and you're fighting, but you're really fighting for power because the foreigners aren't governing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, you know, there are some places where you will get anti-Americanism. There are some places where you get people who say, well, you know, the Americans could win if they wanted, so if they have it, that's because they want to stay and therefore they, you know, should either go or win. And you get places where the Taliban are taking a hit for the fact that they're continuing the war and why are you doing this? The foreigners are gone. So it's a mix, but overall, no. There is no great rising tendency of anti-Americanism, and I would say of the five odd wars I can think of where we are engaged, this is the one where we're actually welcome. And I don't think, <laughs> you, know, I don't think I like you, can, you can't say that about Iraq or Syria or Yemen or Libya or Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if that's your standard of comparison, we are overwhelmingly more welcome in Afghanistan. You said Afghanistan hasn't been in the news much, but it was in the news today in a kind of a strange story about uh, the number of visas being so low for, for people who have been translating oh, it's for, it's for the special American visas. Special Forces. Yeah, yeah, well, and they're, they're not going to be able to come to the United States. They're trying to cut back on the number of visas. Have you heard that story? And what do you think about that? I mean, many soldiers are saying that's you know, really bad for American credibility I, I and so it, forth. I think it is, I think it is bad. I think we have th this risk getting into more detail than you may care to hear, but let me let me try. Well. I think we do have an obligation to people who've been out running around with our forces translating the field. And I know some of them, some of them have been wounded. You know, those people deserve the visas. I think we've let the program expand in one way wrongly so that anybody who works for us for a year is now eligible for a special immigrant visa. I do not think Afghans who work for us at our embassy or previously our consulates in the cities or for our American bases, our big bases, Kabul, I don't think they're any more at risk than Afghan government civilians working for the Afghan government. I think mm -hmm. it was a mistake to expand the visa program to everybody who works for us. Um, and and the result has been that we've had a terrible turnover in Afghan local employees because a lot of people have gotten jobs in order to get the eligibility yeah. to get the visa for to a get year out. And go to the US, so, you right. know, having had this terrible problem of turning our own personnel over too fast to have a learning mm -hmm. organization, we've now magnified it with our local staff. Mm -hmm. um, so, big issue. I think the program should continue. I think it's ridiculous that we're cutting it back, especially for some of the Iraqis. Because uh, it involves Iraqis as well as Afghans. Yeah, Iraqis and um, Afghans, yeah. But I think the program also needs some fine tuning so that we're not in a kind of isometric struggle with ourselves. Right. Did you want to open it to questions or one more? I'm right. she, she's, I can do one more, okay. So here's my last question. I was reading something uh, that really depicts the conflict in Afghanistan as more of a conflict between, as like a proxy war for India and China. You know, where the Karzai or Dari regime is the, the Indian side and the Pakistanis are the Chinese side. Do you see it as a proxy war? Do you adopt that? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a reading I assigned to all my yeah. students, so I want to know <laughs> whether you believe it or not. <laughs> so um, I think it was a... It, is a, it yeah. has a strong element of a proxy war for Pakistan. Much stronger than for any of the other players. And the Pakistani element needs to be addressed. To see it entirely as a regional proxy war, mm -hmm. that I think is a mistake. But if we get out, it will become true. Because what you will then see is Iran, Russia, Pakistan, India, each has worries about what can go on in Afghanistan, and each will fund supporters in order not to lose. They won't mm -hmm. fund them, support them to win. Mm -hmm. They will fund them to prevent things that Anyone they else. think are against their interests. And so then you will have a full-scale proxy war, mm -hmm. as you did before, in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're seeing some signs of that now. The Russians and the, China, the Russians and the Iranians, in particular, have picked up their ties with the Taliban. They've been public about that, and mm -hmm. they have said publicly that that's there are two reasons. One, they see the Islamic State coming into Afghanistan, 
that scares them more than the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, they think we're getting out and we're going to leave a mess behind us. And therefore, they look at their, uh, you know, their interests and they say, well, you know, this is terrible, but that's even worse. So we'll go over here. So as you get this notion that we're going home and leaving a mess, then you will draw in the proxy war. But your feeling is that Pakistan isn't just in this to counter India. Well, do you know what I mean? I mean because India seems yeah. to support the government. India wants pa Pakistan sees Indians behind every rock. Right. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, in all fairness to Pakistan, you know, remember the old joke that even paranoids have real enemies. Um, <laughs> you know, Pakistan is pretty paranoid about Afghanistan, and sometimes they have enemies. Uh, but it is terribly worried about Indian influence. And so it thinks that you know, it's worried, one, about Indian influence, two, it's convinced we'll go. The two together provide the impetus to support the Taliban. The former chief of staff, General Kayani, was at one point totally up front with one of our, I think it was General Allen. Uh, he said, I think you're going to abandon this project. And you're going to leave us with a mess. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to have friends when you do. So we're going to support the friends. Uh, this goes to the story, which has not really been confirmed in hard numbers, that the new administration is going to propose a 37% cut in the State Department budget as part of the cuts to fund the defense increase. Uh, let me ask a question first of all. I want to see what perspective. How many people in the audience think that our foreign aid, State Department, all this stuff together is at least 10% of the federal budget? Nobody? Nobody believes that. Good. Um, you're separate from most Americans. Mm -hmm. Overwhelming number of public opinion surveys show that Americans tend to believe State Department foreign aid, all this is somewhere around 20% or 25%. It's actually just under 1% of the federal budget. So, you know, you can destroy us. You can't get much out of us. Um, <laughs> Taking, what is that phrase, water from stone or something? Yeah. Um, second, I think it's really important to understand Diplomacy is the first line of defense of the nation in a great many respects. It's the diplomats who are in the 270-odd countries and trying both to advance American interests, push American business, help Americans in trouble, and basically see what's coming up over the horizon. There's nobody else doing that in that way. And it's a job with more risk than I think people understand. We've had since 9-11, we have had, I think it was, I think I made a note the other day, 190? Yeah. We've had 290 attacks on American diplomatic facilities since 9-11. And we've had about 90 people killed, a lot of them local security, but working for us, mm -hmm. and a certain number of American security officers and diplomats, contractors. Um, so it's not a risk-free profession. Uh, <laughs> even post-Benghazi. It is essential, first of all, to avoid wars. You can pay for a lot of diplomats for a long time for the cost of one war, or even deploying one brigade. Secondly, when you go to war, you don't stop politics. And the diplomats are an incredibly important part of figuring out how you end war and how you transition to something else. Uh, and they're the ones who have to clean up the mess after the war. So maintaining a professional, maintaining and supporting and developing a professional diplomatic service and maintaining it in the field is enormously important to America's long-term interests. And you really will take a big, big hit by cutting that, and you won't get much out of it. Oh. There you go. Thank you. I have a feeling I'm speaking to the converted, yes, however. You are. But, uh, For the most part. But if you get to talk to your friends, maybe you can convert some of them. 
First, thank you both for the interesting conversation tonight. I appreciate that, and I very much appreciate the answer to the last question. Uh, but my question here is, throughout the talk tonight, there's been no real definition of the long term. We've heard we need to be in Afghanistan for the long term, the long term, the long term. I'm starting to think the long term is infinity because we have no way of defining what that is. And I also have not heard much of when we realize we have reached the long term. What is the success? How do we know when we're there? So right now I see us being there for a long term and not knowing when that ends. I wonder if you could speak to that, please. I can, probably not with as much clarity as you or I wish, but I can. If we define success as an Afghan state that can basically keep control of most of its territory, albeit with fighting going on, then I think you, it's hard to put timelines on it, but I think you can begin to say, okay, you can break some of that down into what needs to happen. The government has got to become somewhat less corrupt and it's got to become somewhat more efficient. You can start breaking that down into pieces. Now, I think, I, I don't think you could actually lay out a five-year time plan that way. Uh, but I think you could lay out some of the things you really want to see in the next one year. And you can demand that some of those happen. But you need to have a conversation to begin with about whether what you're laying out is reasonable without being absurd or, or without being so dumbed down. I mean, I wouldn't want to dumb it down to the point that you're just listing things because you can achieve them and say that's progress. That, that won't help. On the other hand, if you set the bar too high, it's silly, you don't get progress. So that's why I was saying, I can see some things that have to change in the next year, in the military leadership particularly. If they change, I'd be encouraged to go forward. If they don't change, then I think you have to start saying, have we arrived at the point where it, it is infinity or nothing? And, and then we have to think about getting out. But I don't think we've ever teed the issue up in this kind of way. I don't know if that's a full answer, but it's as close as I can come. So to follow up then, you are saying we do put benchmarks in there, we do put timelines on the benchmarks, we just don't tell anybody what the timelines are. Because then I we think have artificial we have deadlines. A few, I think we have a few conditional timelines, but they're not timelines of massive departure. They're timelines to give us, or benchmarks that give us the basis to say, are we, are we making any progress or not? But I don't think you can lay out the kind of timeline the Obama administration tried to do. It, it doesn't work. And frankly, it was done without any real discussion of whether any of the civilian parts of the timeline were the least bit realistic. I did some research on that. I asked. No, they never discussed that. They just put it down on paper. Thank you. I think we have some follow-up questions that, that dovetail nicely. Um, first is the question of corruption. What can we do to um, really tackle the corruption that's taking place in the Afghan government? Um, and also thinking about economic growth as um, you know, a tool for stability. Um, do you see any potentials for economic growth uh, in the country? Let me do the economic growth first because I can do it faster. And I, I may bog you down in the answer to the second, but <laughs> I want to be realistic. On economic growth, first of all, yes, there is much more potential than we knew about. Uh, there is, at least the structures are there, there's more gas, there's more oil, there's uh, cop large copper deposits, iron deposits, uh, even some rare earth, not to mention gemstones and various other things. The question on the developing those long-term resources is whether the Afghan state lays down the regulatory structure that develops these in a way that help the state, or whether they mimic the Russian experience and empower a few oligarchs who rip the state off and make money. 
So the potential is there, you don't know which way it'll go. Secondly, uh, you're seeing an outflow of money now because of a lack of confidence. That, I'm not saying the money will all pour back in if there is more confidence in what we're going to do, but the Obama policies created a belief that we were leaving, and that has f increased the, pros the process of the outflow um, of, of Afghan money, and that's really the key. You, a Afghans have to believe in their own economy enough to put their money in it before you should expect that any foreigners are going to stick any money in. Uh, but the short answer to the long-term economic question is yes, there is an economic path ahead. And in fact, you are seeing some change. When I was out in October, I was somewhat surprised because I was getting this from business, Afghan business people and journalists, not from government figures. And a whole bunch of people also suddenly told me that tax collection had gotten more honest, that they were not paying bribes. They're complaining bitterly about how much time they spend negotiating things with the tax authorities, but you know that's kind of a normal teething problem. Uh, bank regulation is getting better. Uh, one banker uh, was telling me that he felt that, actually his complaint was that it was so strict that it was very difficult to fund, to make loans for smaller startups because they couldn't meet the economic requirements of the loans. But that's kind of a normal economic problem for a developing country. You'd like to see more problems like that mm -hmm. instead of massive fraud. So it, it's some limited good news, a potential way ahead, no guarantee. On corruption, um, I think you can begin to limit it. I think the idea that you're going to eliminate it, probably not. A good piece of the third world has corruption. District of Columbia actually keeps indicting its civilian officials, so it's, we're not completely immune. Um, but I think we also have to, we have to have a very different approach. I don't know if we can, because it's, it's antithetical to what we as Americans want to do. We want to treat corruption as, first of all, a moral failing, and second, a process to be fixed juridically. Um, the moral failing problem has this issue. If you live in a society where you're not sure about survival, then the rational motivation for the individual is to try to grab what you can to cover yourself, your family. It takes a lot of confidence in the state, in the f having a future, to just respond to the moral imperative. You know, Remember, this is a country which has been at war for 40 years, close to 40 years now. It's hard for Americans to understand what that means. I'll give you one example, if you pardon me for one small anecdote. There's an Afghan, I was telling you about this Afghan charity, the Afghan-run girls' school. The director of that now is a very dynamic young Afghan woman, went to school in the States. She told me when she first came to the States, got off the plane, met her American host family, and they said, you know, you're really, you've picked a really good time to come because in whatever it was, two months, we have a, a holiday, three-day weekend, we're gonna go off to some amusement park. She said, her first reaction is, how can these people possibly be planning for something two months ahead? Mm -hmm. And she spent most of the next two months waiting for something to happen to derail that plan. That was her, because that's her life experience of the uncertainty of life. Now, in that uncertainty, people end with expectations of how you take care of your family and your clan and your supporters. You're probably going to have a measure of corruption to deal with. But what you've got to do is you've got to get that down to a level where you deliver services, where it's not rapacious gobbling up everything, leaving nothing. We had a level of corruption in this country, in our major cities for the better part of 100 years, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, they all had their bosses, their rigs, they all took a piece. But we still drive on bridges they built, we still use buildings they've put up, they didn't fall down. So the first pressure has to be to that. Now some big people have to be brought to justice, 
but it, this has to be a gradual process of demanding efficiency, of bringing the really recalcitrant down. Um, we may have to be prepared to have something that's not very juridical. You know, we want to have we want to have corruption controlled, and we want it all to be a good justice process. It takes years in our country to build a legal case to, to make it stick, but we want this to happen. You know, we, we have a certain irrationality about this. We were working in a country years ago. My father knew one governor well enough to ask him about rumors of corruption. And the governor was slightly offended, and he said, I never took more than was expected. <laughs> um, but in fact, a lot of the world runs that way, because if you know what's expected, it you know, functions like a tax. It's a cost of business. You know what it is. You can calculate it. You get what you pay for. You go on with business. It's when corruption runs massively off the rails, and because, you, know, you don't know what it'll cost. You have to pay everybody. You get nothing. Nothing happens. That's totally destroying. Having that conversation is a hell of a lot more sophisticated than what we generally want to talk about. But I think that's where we have to go in order to begin working with the Afghan government. And I, there's, again, some of this is beginning. They've indicted a number of officials in the interior ministry, some of them senior officials. Um, they have put back in jail some of the people in Kabul Bank. So there, there's a few good signs. I think we have to encourage those while being realistic about what we're pushing for. Let's assume for a minute, you know, theoretical basis, we can come up with benchmarks that we would say are indications for moving forward. Uh, for example, uh, such and such within an infrastructure, so many schools, kind of the health care, the command of so much of a, the part of the country and so forth. And we find after those deadlines are not met or those check marks are not met year after year after year, at what point does the United States say, say we're going down the wrong way. It's time to cut and leave. It's just not going to happen because of the indigenous population. This is not the right time. Uh, it's a warlord-based society that we just can't penetrate or we haven't been able to after being very careful in setting these goals. When do we say it's time to leave? I, I think, first of all, I think those are the wrong goals. Uh, they're nice indicators. But they're nice indicators, but I think they're the wrong goals. Okay, let's say so, we put yeah, in the let, right goals. Yeah, okay. uh, I would set the first goals are military. If we keep losing the war, then we're in the wrong place. So the first goals have to be about security. Okay. They, they have to be about improving command, and they have to be about seeing some places that are taken back. I think those goals are a lot easier to set because they're about outcomes on the ground. They're not about sort of lists of schools and roads. If we don't see some parts of those goals, some improvements, further improvements in the military, certain commanders that I could list, I don't know that I'd want to make the whole list public, but I think one could have a list and you'd want to see some fairly serious progress in a year or two. Because if you don't see that, then you are for sure just revolving in place. Okay. But I would make the list much more initially much more security directed. And if we had a list of indicators that were security indicated, at what point do we say, this is just not going to work? We've supplied the arms, we've provided the, the military uh, training, we've provided the tanks, artillery, we've got air support. And their battalion commander seem, well, he's not succeeding, let's give it to his brother-in-law. And that guy doesn't work, well, let's give it to his friend. And all the rest of this kind of crap that goes on with corruption that occurred in South Vietnam, for example. At what point do we say, it's just not worth it, it's not going to happen. And I'm not asking I mean, you to say that, but no, I think, to me, we've got to be I able think to you do. It. I think you have to have some point in your own mind, and you almost certainly have to not say that publicly because then you confuse people about what you're doing. Um, and you probably got to pin that out far enough that you've got two years. I mean, you got a four year horizon because at that point you're going to have another election and another administration here. So you want something less than four years and you want something more than a year that's probably too short to get organized. But, 
I remember in the War College, we used to joke about some issues. Well, we know it's, you know, smaller than a football field and bigger, bigger than a bread box. Um, this has a little bit of that. I, I think you could have a great deal of argument. I could, you know, pull some things out of the air. But it would be somewhere more than a year and less than four that you'd have to have in your own mind. We, we have time for just one more question. We'd uh, have more time if I gave shorter answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then you'd have to ask simpler questions. All right, here's a simple question. Ah, for you there. All right, okay. I'm braced. Uh, in, in Vietnam, there was a Phoenix program. And uh, mm -hmm. while there was complications with that in terms of vengeance, killing the wrong assassinations and such, would the same... Uh, and I hate to say, you know, whether it's it's a command issue or or a SOG issue or whatever, but uh, would the same uh, procedures work here uh, to take out the, uh, I guess, the negative personnel? Yeah. Do um, you want to do a quick explanation of Phoenix? Do you want me to do it? Because I'm not sure everybody in the audience knows what it was. Oh, okay. Um, that was but, uh, that was yeah. the the assigned assassination. Yeah. It was, yeah. they, I mean, it was a takedown of the command and control. Actually, we've done, we've done a lot of that in Afghanistan and had an enormous amount of success in killing mid-level commanders. That hasn't, it wasn't the same as the Phoenix program, but it was, um, this was done by our special operators and they have made enormous developments over the last few years in how fast they can turn these programs, their use of the intelligence gathered in them, the effectiveness. It's very clear that we've taken out a huge number of mid-level commanders in the Taliban. Now this has done various things. On a short-term basis, and this was particularly during the period where we were heavily engaged, it did produce a lot of disruption. It, it did set them back repeatedly, but it set them back tactically. They've shown an enormous capacity to regenerate mid-level leadership. Yeah. Um, and frankly, you know, he killed somebody's brother and you kind of tick them off. And so they, that helps. It gives you tactical advantage, but it doesn't give you strategic advantage because they regenerate. Also, it has not touched the senior leadership because senior leadership all stays in Pakistan. Some of them have moved out of the border areas and they're down in big cities like Karachi. Uh, so it helps you tactically, but it has a limited strategic purpose and it doesn't get you to victory. Uh, but it still has a role. And in fact, the most effective Afghan military units are the commandos that we've spent the most time training. We don't run those strikes anymore. They're still doing those kind of strikes in Afghanistan. You don't hear much about them because they're Afghan run. We have special forces sometimes that go along with them, but they're hanging back. They're not running the strike. Um, in fact, one of the things that, that one of the good signs that struck me the last time I was out in October, because one of the big questions I had a year or two ago when we were pulling off was whether the Afghans were going to be able to create the intelligence structure that would create what we call targeting packages. That is what you're doing, who you're going after. Because they were, we'd done a good job of teaching them how to jump out of helicopters and attack houses, but we were still the ones who were building the targeting packages. Mm -hmm. Over the last year and a half, I'm now told, so I prod people and ask these questions, that in fact, they are now developing their own targeting packages, which are guiding their special forces. The big problem with their special forces is they're being overworked. They're being used for too many things simultaneously, being drawn to fix when you have a military defeat, a Kunduz, you throw the special forces in, but then you need to get that kind of elite unit out and let, other, let heavier units take their place, otherwise you grind them up. That's the problem. It's not the problem of creating the force. So long answer, uh, but the basic question is, a lot of that does go on. It works very well tactically. It isn't a strategic success. I mean, it's not a failure. It just doesn't give you the level of strategic success you need. I think we've run out of time is what you're telling us, Erica. 
Dr. Uh, Divin, uh, Ambassador Newman, thank you very much for such an outstanding discussion and conversation on such a you know, uh, complex um, and uh, important region. Um, so we really appreciate uh, you know, um, the opportunity to really uh, you know, have this program here. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, give you uh -oh. <laughs> a gift. Uh, this, uh, let me just uh, quickly explain, um, Ambassador Newman, uh, we wanted to uh, give you this, uh, um, you know, small token of appreciation, uh, and this is a book on Qatar, yeah, Qatar, written by uh, Diane, uh, Diana uh, Untermeyer, and you might know, mm -hmm. um, who presented uh, to our council in 2013. Uh, she lived in Qatar while her husband Chase uh, Untermeyer served as U.S. ambassador um, there uh, from 2004 to 2007. As uh, so someone with extensive experience uh, like you in the Gulf region, we uh, thought that you might enjoy this Thank book. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's a very well chosen gift. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So thank you so much uh, for being here. We will have our next uh, Great Decision Program on March 20th, Monday, with Georgetown professor and CEO of Safe Source Trading, Jeremy Heft, presenting on trade and U.S. jobs. So Mr. Heft will unpack the um, rhetoric of our recent presidential election, whether the data supports the idea that trade means China wins and U.S. Uh, you know loses. Um, you know, so it will be really interesting discussion. I'm sure. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next program. So everybody, again, thank you. Have a very good night. Thank you.